Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Jaro Del Hiron from the Department of Human Structural Biology, and we're here to discuss the anatomy and physiology of the digestive system. Okay, these are our uh, learning outcomes to identify the organs and accessory glands of the digestive system. To know the functions of each organ and the structures of the digestive system, to outline the phases of digestion, we have to review the blood and nerve supply and just give an example of the common disorders of the digestive system. Okay, basically, or generally speaking, when we say digestive system, we have functions, and these are the following we take in food, we break down the food that we intake. We absorb the digested materials, we provide nutrients, and the digestive system, the last part would be eliminating the waste products of the digestion. Okay, and let's start with the oral cavity. Okay, once uh, the food is intake in here, it goes to the pharynx. Through the salivary glands, we have uh, digestive enzymes that break down macromolecules such as your carbohydrates, your fats, and your lipids, as well as your proteins. It goes to the esophagus. It enters to the stomach to store it. And then after uh, four to six hours in our regular intake, it empties into the stomach. It goes first into the first part of the uh, small intestine, which is your duodenum. It goes in here to the small intestine and goes to your Cecum, which is the first part of your large intestines. It goes to the transverse colon, uh, sorry, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, uh, sigmoid, and to the rectum. And obviously, elimination of waste products will be at the anus. Okay, but first, no, uh, there is this what we call peritoneum. This is a layer of smooth epithelial cells. So when we say mesenteries, these are connective tissue organs in the abdominal cavity. We have greater omentum and we have lesser omentum. Uh, lesser omentum is the mesentery that connects the lesser curvature of the stomach to the liver and diaphragm. While your greater omentum connects, or this is the mesentery that connects the greater curvature of the stomach to the transverse colon and the rest of the posterior butt. Body wall. <laughs> okay, this is a uh, uh, sagittal section of the whole abdominal. This is the liver. No, as you can see here, if this is the stomach, it go. This is the greater amentum, and this is the mesentery proper. This this connects the small intestine to the mesentery proper. Okay. Now, as you all know, anteriorly, the, the urinary bladder is anterior to the rectum. Okay, that's the medial view. That, that um, the peritoneum lines the abdominal cavity and the visceral peritoneum lines the abdominal organs. Okay. All right. So let's first discuss the oral cavity. That's the first part of the digestive system. So when we say mouth or oral cavity, it contains stratified squamous epithelium. Okay? Uh, at first, well, when we take uh, food, the first gland that will be activated will be the salivary glands. They produce saliva, which contains enzymes to break down carbohydrates into glucose. Okay, As you all know, carbohydrates is a macromolecule. It's a form of um, macromolecule to give us glucose, which serves as the energy. Okay, It also cleanses the mouth, one of the functions of the salivary glands, and it dissolves and moistens the food. Okay, That's your salivary glands. What are the enzymes? No? When you say enzyme, when you say amylase, it's a salivary enzyme that specifically break down carbohydrates into glucose. And we will be talking about different types of uh, disaccharide, monosaccharide, no polysaccharide um, at the end of the lecture. Lysozyme, on the other hand, is also found at the salivary glands. There are salivary enzymes that are active against bacteria. 
uh, part of the oral cavity is the tongue. No? It houses the taste buds and the mucus. Okay, this is the oral cavity. No? Let's, let's uh, uh, describe the oral cavity. As you can see, you have here the hard palate and the soft palate. Okay, uh, at the center, at the midline, is our uvula. Uh, at both sides are the cheek, and usually you have the tongue. No, the frenulum of the tongue is found in fear of the tongue, and usually you have the openings here of the of one of the saliva glands, which is your openings of the submandibular ducts, obviously from the submandibular gland. Uh, the teeth here, no, it's, it is actually composed of 32 total number in adult, while 20 as your baby teeth, okay, your milk teeth. Uh, lower part of the tongue is your, here at the sides are the molars, your premolars, your canine, and your incisors, okay, also on the opposite side. You also have your upper lip and you have your lower lip, no, for um, uh, easier digestion of the food. Okay, as I mentioned a while ago, when you say teeth, we have 32 teeth in a normal adult. We have the incisors, as you can see from the previous slide. We have your canine, your premolars, your molars, and your wisdom tooth. You have 20 primary teeth, or your baby teeth, or your milk teeth. No? Now, each tooth has crown, your cusp, your neck, and your root. And at the center of the tooth, we call this your pulp cavity. We'll be mentioning that um, on the next slide. Enamel is the hard covering that protects the teeth against abrasion. Cavities are actually breakdown of enamel by acids from bacteria. Now, don't mind this slide. No? We will not be talking about all these specificities, but this one. Now, this is the molar tooth that is placed in the alveolar bone. This is the bone, okay? Now, a tooth consists of, number one, a crown, this area, your neck, and your root. Your root here is covered with what we call cemento, okay? Cement, but we call this cemento. Okay, it is held in the socket by this ligaments called your periodontal ligaments. Okay, in the nerves, the vessels, they enter and exit the tooth through the foramen. No? And in that part, that's the root test, that, that's the root deepest to the alveolus. Okay, so these are the pulp cavity, which contains the nerves and blood vessels. It, it is continuously up to here, up to the alveolar bone. Okay. As mentioned a while ago, when we say animal, that is the hard covering that protects the tooth. No? Here is the animal. We have dentin here, and the gingiva is also known as your gums. Okay, so that would be used to grind food, to break down food into uh, small pieces. Okay, let's go on to the palate. Now, palate is the roof of the oral cavity, as you saw the picture a while ago. The anterior part is the hard palate, while the posterior part is the soft palate. Okay. Okay. After that oral cavity, uh, let's talk about salivary glands more. It includes the submandibular gland, the sublingual gland, and the parotid gland. So basically, generally speaking, when you say salivary glands, they produce saliva. No, which contains enzymes to break down food. And we call, the, this is the number one uh, medical condition, there is an inflammation of the parotid band, we call it MOPS. Okay? Usually, it is caused by a virus. Okay, please take note of the different glands, of the salivary glands. Uh, one would be parotid gland. The type of secretion that parotid gland secretes is purely serous. Okay, take note of that. Next would be the submandibular gland. Type of secretion, it's a mixed type of secretion, but predominantly there are of ser serous type. Okay, and the sublingual gland, that's the mixed type of secretion, predominantly of mucus type. Okay, so take note of this slide. 
<clears throat> okay, as you can see, these are the following salivary glands. We have the parotid gland, that's the largest salivary gland. And we call this uh, gland, we call this duct where the secretion um, where the secretion passes through is the parotid duct. Okay. That is um, the parotid gland is um, uh, outer of this masseter muscle. Okay. That is a muscle of mastication. Next would be this one. This is the submandibular gland. Obviously, if this is the, if this is the mandibular bone, it is found at the submandibular gland. This is what we call the submandibular duct, where the secretion from the submandibular gland passes through. Okay, and lastly, the sublingual gland. If this is the tongue, sublingual, lingual is the tongue, so it is found. Uh, the, the, there are ducts. Those are ducts of sublingual glands. And as you can see from the name itself, lingual, it is uh, found in fear of the tongue. Okay? So there you have it. The different salivary glands and take note of the different types of secretion of each gland. Okay? As seen here by this particular slide. Okay, next. You have the pharynx. So this is your throat. It connects your mouth to the esophagus. Okay. Now in this, um, from the throat actually it's composed of three, uh, the, the pharynx is composed of three parts. You have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Okay. And that the pharynx, this connects here the, from the mouth. It connects the mouth to the esophagus, which is uh, here, that's the tube that connects the pharynx to the stomach or the storage organ. It transports food uh, to the stomach and it joins the stomach at the cardiac opening. This is the esophagus class. So from this tip of the air, from this tip of the pointer, up to this air, so this is the esophagus. It's the muscular tube that connects pharynx to the stomach. So this is the stomach. Uh, the esophagus will be joined by the stomach by this area called your cardia or the cardiac opening that is found at the stomach. Okay, another medical condition would be heartburn. Okay, heartburn is a condition. It's uh, one of the most common conditions that uh, we frequently see at the ER. No? This, is, this occurs when gastric juices regurgitate into esophagus. It is caused by uh, excessive amount of intake of caffeine, smoking, eating or drinking in excess. So basically, if you have acid production that's happening here at the stomach, if it regurgitates, it goes here. It, uh, we usually call this acid reflux disease or acid peptic disease. Okay? Heartburn, meaning dog butt heartburn, it mimics heart attack sometimes. But um, usually the patients are commonly, they are uh, female who presented at the emergency room with feeling of there's a chest pain. There's burning in their chest. That's the term heartburn. Okay, so heartburn is also an answer acid peptic disease or um, hyperacidity. Okay. All right. Now let's go on to anatomy of the swallowing. Anatomy and physiology of the digestive system. And then as you all know, we have to take note of the swallowing phases. First would be the voluntary phase. So this is when a mass of food, we call it bolus, that is formed in our mouth and it will be pushed into the oropharynx. The next phase will be the pharyngeal phase. This is just a swallowing reflex that is initiated when that mass of food stimulates the receptors in the oropharynx. Now, when it goes to the esophagus, it moves the food from the pharynx to the stomach. We are entering at the esophageal phase. Okay. Then the last phase of swallowing would be the peristalsis. There is this wave-like contractions that move the food through the digestive tract. We call this one the myenteric plexus and our box or our, our, our box plexus. That is a nerve um, plexuses. That is, that's basically the function is to have a motor movement or we call this peristalsis. 
It is found on the muscular layer of all the digestive system or all of the digestive tract wherein the peristalsis uh, occurs. So the responsible for the peristalsis, uh, the nerve responsible for the peristalsis would be the nerve plexus called your myenteric plexus or your arbux plexus. So in short, basically there are four peristalsis. Okay. This is just a, an illustration wherein peristalsis um, is um, what explains the peristalsis for the whole digestive tract. Okay? So, for example, this is the digestive tract. Since it is um, the, the peristalsis is for, from formed uh, during the last part of uh, swallowing, if this is the bolus or mass of food, of the, uh, in the digestive tract, there is a wave of smooth muscle relaxation, okay? This part right here is relaxed, okay? Now, if there is movement, this one will allow the digestive tract to expand. So if there is this wave of relaxation here, this uh, bolus moves, and what we see here is this wave of contraction of smooth muscle that propels the bolus throughout the digestive tract. So it's not all the time that the digestive tract is relaxed or it's not all the time that the digestive tract is um, contracted, okay? So there should be a wave of relaxation right here and a wave of contraction of the smooth muscle. And that's basically because of the myenteric plexus or the arbux plexus. So please take note of that. Okay, so once the food goes to our mouth, it goes to the pharynx. So from the pharynx to the stomach, because of the esophagus, there is that um, food that is um, found already in the stomach. Right? It is located in the abdomen. It is a storage tank for food. So what are the other functions of the stomach? It produces different, um, it produces different secretion. Now, it produces mucus. Hydrochloric acid, protein digesting enzymes. The stomach also contains a thick mucus layer that lubricates and protects the epithelial cells of the stomach wall form acidic pH. The normal pH of the uh, stomach would be 3, that, that is uh, in acidic form. The stomach can actually hold up to 2 liters of food. Okay, that's how. Um, big the stomach can hold no it holds up to two liters of food okay uh, the thick muscular layer this is to produce the churning action okay the rugae specifically found at um, the stomach these are large folds that allow stomach to stretch when there is a massive or mass uh, food that is coming from the mouth to the stomach the chyme here is a paste-like substance that forms when food begins to be broken down. Now, when the food is um, break, broken down into, uh, into small pieces, chyme here is a paste-like substance. Okay, You call it chyme. So from the stomach, once it goes to the small intestine and large intestine, it's now called the chyme. Okay, what else? What is found in the stomach? Okay. We have this pylorus. Pylorus is actually an opening between the stomach and small intestine. So now basically, this, the, the food that we intake uh, that goes down to the stomach is already mixed with different enzymes as well as hydrochloric acid. Okay, The thick ring of smooth muscle around that pyloric uh, opening is what we call pyloric sphincter. The function of the pyloric sphincter is to regulate the passage of food from the stomach to the small intestines. Okay, what we what do we call hunger pangs? Okay, uh, the stomach is stimulated to contract. Okay, by low blood glucose levels, usually twelve to twenty four hours after a meal. That's why uh, we usually uh, experience um, regurgitation or movement of the stomach when. Uh, we feel that we need to eat. Okay, that's what we call hunger pangs. The stomach is stimulated to contract by low blood glucose. So that's the that's the that's the signal that we have to take food right away. Okay.
Okay, so this is the illustration of a stomach. This is the esophagus. This is the cardiac region. The opening from where the esophagus meets the stomach would be the cardiac opening. This is the fundus, the body, and the serosa. The muscularis layer of the stomach, as you can see, it's composed of three um, arrangements. You have the longitudinal, the circular muscle, and the oblique one. No? So once it contracts, no, it moves the food from the stomach, goes to the first part of the small intestine, which is the duodenum. Okay. The rugae, these are folds that, um, that is specifically found in the stomach. Okay. Early part of the discussion, we've talked about the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. This is where the lesser omentum and this is where the greater omentum is attached from the different parts or organs of the digestive tract. Okay. As mentioned a while ago, at the uh, inferior end of the stomach, we call this the pyloric region. Okay. We have the pyloric sphincter that regulates the food coming from the stomach to the small intestine. And this is the pyloric opening. Okay. So it really regulates. That regulates the flow or um, the transition. Uh, of food that uh, are being um, mixed with hydrochloric acid in the stomach to become chyme to, to be reabsorbed, to ready for reabsorption here in the small intestine. Okay, this is just a histology or tissue characteristic of the stomach. As you can see here, no, the red ones, the blue ones, these are actually uh, different types of cell that is found or that are found in the stomach, uh, in the gastric glands of the stomach. What does that mean? It's very important to note that when these are stimulated, they release secretion into the gastric pits. And here is where the secretions will be in contact with the food that we take. Okay. So again, when the food is in the, in the mucosa, here, at the mucosa of the stomach, the different cells will be secreting different secretions not to, not to be in contact now with the food that we take. Okay, so uh, next year will be the histology, uh, human histology. We will be studying that one by one. But at this point, you have to uh, know first the regulation of the stomach secretions. That's part of the physiology of the stomach. Okay. The regulation of the stomach secretions, basically, it is because of the parasympathetic stimulation, hormones gastrin, histamine-increasing stomach secretions. Okay? So there are three phases of regulation of stomach secretions. We have cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phase. Okay? So let's first discuss the cephalic phase. The cephalic phase is when the stomach secretions are initiated by sight, smell, taste, or food thought. Okay? Once you think of a food, a drink, or once you are hungry, cephalic phase will be activated. Now, in this cephalic phase, the vagus nerves, okay? so when you think of a taste, smell, or thought, or tactile sensation in mouth, there is increased salivation that will stimulate this medulla oblongata in our brain. Okay? Number two here is that the vagus nerves, as indicated by this arrow, will carry that parasympathetic action potentials to the stomach here, where the enteric plexus neurons are activated. Uh, once activated, no, the postganglionic neurons will, be, it will stimulate the secretion by the parietal cells and sheath cells. We'll be discussing this later. And they will stimulate the histamine and gastrin secretion in the stomach. Okay. Now, once it goes to the circulation, what will happen is that the gastrin is carried through the blood and it will be back to the stomach, as indicated here by the number four, where along with the histamine stimulates secretion. Okay. This happens during cephalic phase. Now, let's go now to the gastric phase. Now, once there is secretion already, the second phase of the stomach secretion would be the gastric phase. It is characterized 
by partially digested proteins and there is this distance of the stomach that promotes secretion ready in the stomach okay what happens in the gastric phase is that as you can see here there is this tension okay once there is this tension of the stomach it will stimulate the mechanoreceptors that is actually the stretch receptors and they will activate parasympathetic reflex as indicated by the first slide in the stomach secretion. Okay, The action potentials generated by these mechanoreceptors are carried again by these vagus nerves, thus indicating stimulation of secretion again. Okay, This distension of the stomach will activate the local reflexes no, to, that will stimulate again stomach secretions. That was indicated by this orange arrow. That uh, secretion from the histamine and gas chain is carried again through the circulation and then it will be back again to the stomach where it happens again and again. The histamine release, the gas chain release, it stimulates acid production. Okay? Now, Last would be the intestinal phase. Now, once there is, uh, once there is food that is caught up with, um, the hydrochloric acid or acid secretion in the stomach, there is acidic chyme. Okay, this stimulates neuronal reflexes and secretions of hormones that inhibit gastric secretions by negative feedback loops. What does that mean? As you can see here in the intestinal phase, no. There is chyme. Okay? Chyme in the duodenum with pH of less than 2 or containing fat digestion products, which is your lipids, it will inhibit now, meaning it, um, it will stop the secretion of your gastrin or your hydrochloric acid. Okay? Now, once there is inhibition, this chemoreceptor right here in the duodenum are stimulated by this hydrogen or lipids or acids. This will generate by the chemoreceptors that are carried by the vagus nerve to sabihin niya, oops, the vagus nerve would um, uh, will tell the stomach to stop. No? Please stop producing anymore. Okay? They will inhibit this parasympathetic action potentials, thereby they will decrease its gastric secretions because um, the, that vagus nerve will tell our brain to stop secreting anymore, stop stimulating the stomach anymore to secrete secretions or to secrete hydrochloric acid because it's enough. Okay. Now, local reflexes, as indicated by this number three, is activated by this uh, acid or lipids that will also inhibit or decrease its gastric secretion. All right. Now, once... Once the uh, acidic chyme goes to the intestine or the small intestine, particularly at the duodenum, secretin and cholecystokinin that are produced, take note, by the duodenum will decrease also its gastric secretions in the stomach. So there are uh, more or less two or three um, ways on how to decrease gastric acid secretion. Number one, the Vagus nerves uh, inhibiting the parasympathetic action. What else? The local reflexes or lo yeah, the local reflexes that is activated by the acid and lipids will also decrease gas secretions. And lastly, your secretin and cholecystokinin. This will these two enzymes will be discussed in a while once we go to the intestine already. This will also decrease. Through the circulation, it will signal to the stomach to stop secreting gastric secretions. Okay, so there you have it. There, there's your three phases of regulation of the stomach secretion. Okay, what to, what about movement in the stomach? So we're talk, we're, we're done with the secretion, stomach secretions. Let's go now to the movement of the stomach. Mixing waves is actually a weak contraction. It's, a it's a thoroughly mixing food to form chyme, mixing food and acid to form acidic chyme. That's mixing waves. While our peristaltic waves, that's a, that is actually a stronger contraction, it will force the chyme 
toward and through a pyloric sphincter. No? As we all know, a pyloric sphincter is the one that regulates the movement of uh, chyme from the stomach to enter the small intestine this time. Okay. Now, what other um, uh, factors that stimulate stomach secretions? We have hormonal and neural mechanisms, but take note of this. The stomach empties every four hours after a regular meal. But if you have a high fatty meal, you know, high fatty meal, it's much longer. It's usually it empties six to eight hours compared to a, to a regular meal. Okay, please take note of this. Stomach empties every four hours after a regular meal, while six to eight hours after a high fatty meal. Okay. Okay, so this is just the mixing. Now, the mixing wave uh, here is initiated in the body of the stomach that progresses towards the pyloric sphincter, as indicated by the, this pink arrow. That's the mixing wave. The more fluid part of the chyme here uh, is pushed toward the pyloric sphincter. This is the pyloric region. This is the pyloric sphincter. Now, it is pushed towards this. Whereas the more solid center of the chyme, it will squeeze past the peristaltic constriction. Now, after squeezing it, it will go to the pyloric sphincter. Okay, the purple. Okay, this purple right here. Um, there's this peristaltic waves, or the that's the purple arrow. It, it, it they move in the same direction here, as indicated by this one as indicated by this one, in the same way as mixing waves, but they are stronger. That's the difference between a mixing wave and a peristaltic wave. Okay, Peristaltic waves are much stronger compared to your mixing waves. Okay, again, the more fluid part of the chyme is pushed towards no, as indicated by this blue arrow, it is pushed towards this pyloric region. Whereas the more solid center of the chyme squeezes past the peristaltic section back toward the body of the stomach. That is indicated by this orange arrow. Okay. And lastly, the peristaltic contractions. It will force a few milliliters of most fluid chyme through the pyloric opening into the duodenum. That is indicated by this step number five. So most of the time, including the more solid portion, is forced back here toward the body of the center for further mixing. Once there is a few milliliters of the fluid, it will go again to the uh, um, uh, pyloric region to be uh, forced to the in, into the uh, large into the small intestine or the duodenum. Okay, that would be movements of the chyme in the stomach. Okay, please take note of this. There are different cells of the gastric glands, not just the hydrochloric acid secretion. Okay, what are the other cells of the gastric glands and what are the, its secretory products? First would be the surface mucocells and the mucous neck cells. They actually both produce mucin. Okay, but the surface mucous cells, there are mucin, they produce mucin in an alkaline fluid, while your mucous neck cells produce mucin in an acidic fluid. Okay, the parietal cells are actually the characteristic cells of the stomach. No, they are the parenchyma. We'll be talking about that next school year. But please take note at this level that the parietal cells are the characteristic cells and they are the ones producing the hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. What do you mean by hydrochloric acid? Look, this, uh, this uh, acid will be mixed to the food for further um, to become acidic chyme. Well, the intrinsic factor is also produced by the parietal cells. They are involved in um, reabsorption of vitamin B12. So if there is no intrinsic factor that is found in the stomach, secreted by the parietal cells, there will be no vitamin B12 reabsorption. And the vitamin B12 reabsorption happens in small intestines. Okay. Next cell of the gastric glands that's also found in the stomach are your chief cells. They actually release pepsinogen 
and lipase. And lastly is your G cells or your enteroendocrine cells. Your clue here is that G cells secrete G, gastrin. But take note, they are your enteroendocrine cells found in the stomach. Okay? All right. So after mixing in the stomach, after producing acid in the stomach, let's go now to the small intestine. Anatomically speaking, they measure 6 meters in length. Okay? They are the major absorptive organ. And that that kind, that acidic kind that, that are actually mixed with the food in the stomach takes three to five hours to pass through the whole or the entirety of the small intestine. The small intestine contains enzymes to further break down food or chyme. It also contains secretions for protection against chyme's acidity. Okay? And when you say small intestine, it is composed of these three parts. The duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. When we talk about diameter, duodenum has the, ha has the largest diameter, but they are the shortest. It is actually a C-shaped organ or part of the small intestine. When we say jejunum, that's 2.5 meters long and it absorbs nutrients. And ileum, if we are talking about anatomically, they are the, they are the longest part of our longest segment of the small intestine, measuring 3.5 meters long. Ilium being the longest, at the end of the ilium is the cecum. So that's the ileocecal valve where, where the small intestine meets the large intestine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and this is the um, illustration of a small intestine. So this is the stomach. This is the C shape. Uh, duodenum that is the first part of the duodenum of the small intestine rather it is the shortest but it has the widest or biggest diameter the jejunum and this is the ileum okay this is your ileocecal valve where it meets the cecum the cecum actually that's the part of the uh, large intestine that is the most proximal to our appendix Okay, again, appendix is part, not part, it's um, the cecum is the segment of a large intestine that is most proximal to our, to our appendix. Okay. Okay, what else? Uh, anatomy and histology of the duodenum, as you can see by this uh, particular slide, shows you circular folds. Okay. What are the circular folds? This is what we call your plica. Uh, circularis, no? it's a circular folds. Letter B is actually intestinal villi. These are your finger-like projection found in the mucosa of the small intestine. And lastly, no, this is, for example, a single villus. As you can see here, there is a lacteal, the lymph, and capillary network no? that supplies each villi. And you will be talking about that uh, more thoroughly next school year under um, human histology. Okay, now, once, um, once we are done at the small intestine, this is where majority of their reabsorption take place at the small intestine. So what does large intestine do? Its main function is to absorb also water from indigestible food, okay? But usually, this is like 10 to 20% or roughly 10%, but most of the absorption happens in the small intestine. Remember that. The large intestine contains your cecum, your colon. When we say colon, we have your ascending, your transverse, your descending, and your sigmoid colon, your rectum, and the uh, last part or the caudal part will be the anal canal, okay? As we talk about cecum, it joins the small intestine as mentioned a while ago with the ileocecal junction and which has appendix attached to it. Appendix is uh, a 9 centimeter structure that is often removed, but not all the time. No? Appendix is, uh, appendicitis or acute appendicitis is one of the 
um, most commonly uh, encountered uh, condition at the emergency room with a right lower quadrant pain. Okay, it is characterized by a right lower quadrant pain. Uh, sometimes you have fever. Uh, the the abdominal pain started at the epigastric area. From from the epigastric, within the next twenty four hours, you have to observe because if it migrates down to the right lower quadrant, you suspect an acute appendicitis. And appendicitis is not just treated with an antibiotics. Uh, the definitive management for appendicitis is the removal of the appendix or what we call your appendectomy. That's the removal of the appendix. Because um, uh, if, if, if it is left untreated, uh, an acute appendicitis could rupture. You, know, you have a ruptured appendix that will poison your whole abdominal cavity. And it will actually lead to death if it, left, if it is left untreated. Okay, so appendicitis again is treated by antibiotics, early recognition that it is an appendicitis, and surgery or a surgical removal of the appendix. Okay, colon. No, it is 1.5 meters long. It contains suspension, the ascending, the transverse, descending, and the sigmoid regions. Your rectum is actually a straight tube that begins as a sigmoid and ends at the anal canal. Okay. Anal canal, that's the last two to three centimeter of the digestive tract. The food takes 18 to 24 hours to pass through this canal. The product of water, indigestible, indigestible food, and microbes, that's what we call your feces or your stool. As medical laboratory science students, later on during your internship, um, in the clinical microscopy section of any laboratory in the hospital, we are the ones who examine feces, okay, or stool sample. Uh, particularly if that particular, if, if particularly if the patient complains of diarrhea, or sometimes a newborn or or a child or a kid complaining of diarrhea, vomiting, we usually request as doctors to to have their stool examined. Okay, and we can find a parasite in there, bacteria, what else? Um, indigestible food, um, and so much more. But basically, we want to know if there is a parasitic infection that that particular patient is going through because of the diarrhea symptoms. Microbes, no, they also synthesize vitamin K found in the colon or any part of the colon. They have this good bacteria that synthesize vitamin K. Okay, so this illustration would tell us the large intestine consists of the cecum here, where your appendix is attached, your ascending colon, your transverse colon, and your descending colon. This is your sigmoid colon. The rectum, as indicated by the description, it is a straight tube from the sigmoid colon down here at the anal canal. Okay, anal canal, you have two sphincters there. You have the internal anal sphincter and your external anal sphincter. This uh, two sphincter, if there is a condition or there is an engorged uh, veins here at the anus, you will produce what we call hemorrhoids or almoranes in Tagalog. Okay. Okay, what else? Uh, tenia coli. Yeah, tenia coli are actually bonds of smooth muscles along the length of the colon. This is your tenia coli. And you will see this microscopically also, grossly and microscopically, uh, that tenia coli that is very specific to the large intestines. Okay, a uh, picture in your right side is actually a radiograph or x ray of the large intestine with the barium enema, meaning the patient ingested this barium or contrast to really detect no, a small intestine, large intestine, and also this one, the appendix. But uh, this is not usually done if you suspect appendicitis. We usually do a barium enema if you are suspecting any obstruction. No? But uh, acute appendicitis is uh, one of the 
a use, useful, most useful diagnostic imaging is CT scan to recognize appendicitis. Okay, let's go now to the different uh, organs or accessory organs of digestion. First, we have the liver. Now, it weighs about three pounds and they are located at the right upper quadrant of the abdomen under the diaphragm. Liver has right, left, caudate, and quadrate lobes. Where are those? This is the right lobe, which is larger or bigger than the left lobe. Posteriorly, we can see the caudate lobe and the caudate lobe. Okay, caudate, quadrate at the upper and the caudate at the inferior portion of the uh, right liver, right lobe of the liver. Okay. At the porta, you may find hepatic ducts, or portal vein, or hepatic artery. Okay, so, uh, hepatic ducts usually, um, and portal vein and hepatic artery this comprise your portal triad. Okay, or your portal uh, portal triad found in the portal area. Okay, what else? Your porta it is the gate where the blood vessels, ducts, nerves enter and exit the liver. Okay. Your porta receives blood from the hepatic artery. As shown here, there is this hepatic artery that carries oxygenated blood um, from the circulation or from the heart going to the liver. Okay. okay, this is histology of the liver. As you can see, this is the, hepatic, the central vein. This will go to the hepatic vein and into the inferior vena cava that goes through the heart for oxygenation. The uh, liver, its functional unit is your lobule or the central lobule. It is, consists of six portal area or portal triad, one, two, uh, three, four, five, and it's a dito nawala, six. One central vein and you have your six portal area or portal triad, that's your central lobule, okay? Take note of that. That's your functional unit of your liver. Okay. Let's identify grossly or anatomi anatomically the liver ducts. We have uh, four. Hepatic duct or hepatic ducts. We have right and left. That transport bile out of the liver. When there is formation of from the left and the right hepatic duct, you call this one their common hepatic duct. So where are those? So this are your, this is the liver, this is the gallbladder. As you can see, we have the right and left hepatic ducts. Forming those two ducts would be your common hepatic duct right here. Okay. Now going back to the previous slide, this one, your cystic duct is from the gallbladder. Okay. This is from your gallbladder. It joins the common hepatic duct. Now, in this illustration, this is the common hepatic duct. This is the cystic duct coming from the gallbladder. Okay, this is this, this cystic duct and the common hepatic duct. When they are formed into one, it is called your common bile duct. Okay, so in this slide, your common bile duct is formed from two ducts. We have the common hepatic duct and your cystic duct. As indicated in this illustration, this is our common bile duct formed from the cystic duct and common hepatic ducts. Okay, this one, the bile that that um, uh, flow into the common bile duct will be uh, coming out in the uh, hepatobiliary tract at the second part of the duodenum. Now, this is important because only the second part of the duodenum is actually the most important segment of the duodenum because there is the exit from the hepatobiliary tract and actually from the pancreatic duct, okay? The accessory pancreatic duct. Diyan lang yan sa second part of the duodenum, okay? Okay, um, what else? The combined duct empties into the duodenum at the duodenal papilla. Actually, this common bile duct will be formed 
with the pancreatic duct, but their secretions will be coming out from the duodenal papilla. Okay? This is the pancreas. This is the head of the pancreas. This is the tail of the pancreas. As you notice, the tail of the pancreas is actually adjacent or near the spleen. While the head of the pancreas is found in here at the second to third portion of the duodenum. Okay? Pancreatic secretions here will be coming from the pancreas, obviously, uh, may also enter the duodenum through an accessory pancreatic duct, which also empties in the second part of the duodenum. Okay, so please take note of the different ducts in the liver and in the pancreas and where they are um, empties, usually at the second part of the duodenum. Okay, as you notice, gallbladder is a small sac on the inferior surface of the liver. This is the gallbladder, and its main function is to store and concentrate the bile. Take note, they don't secrete bile. They store and concentrate the bile coming from the liver. Okay? Okay, uh, the gallbladder... no. That is found at the inferior part, but the functions of the liver are the following. They have digestive and excretory functions. They store and processes nutrients. They detoxify. They are, so they are involved in, the, in detoxification, in synthesis of new molecules, but basically they secrete almost 700 ml of bile each day. The bile actually dilutes and neutralizes the stomach acid and it breaks down fats. So basically, when you have a, um, a high-fat diet in your diet, you know, when you intake high-fat or alcohol, usually you have increased secretion of your bile. Okay? Sometimes it directly excretes into the second part of the duodenum or sometimes some of the bile will be going to the gallbladder to be stored and they will be caused and then they will be released in, in, in case of there is a high fat diet again. Okay. Now let's talk about the physiology. Why um, the control of your bile secretion and release. Now please take note of the following enzymes. Okay. But first, vagus nerve. No? This will cause the gallbladder to contract, thereby uh, releasing bile into the duodenum. Again, they will just contract. The gallbladder will just contract, but the bile will be coming from the liver. Okay, that's the first one. Vagal nerve stimulation, that's indicated by the red arrow, will cause the gallbladder to contract and release bile into the duodenum. That's the second part. What else? First would be secretin. Okay, this is the purple arrow. The secretin is produced by the duodenum and this will be carried through the circulation to the liver, sorry, to the liver and it will carry through the circulation to stimulate bile secretion. Please bile secrete more because they have detected a high lipid diet or a high fatty diet. Another would be cholecystokinin. They are also produced, this is indicated by the pink arrow. Once they detect a high fatty meal, they will, they will uh, produce by the duodenum. They will carry it into the circulation and they will this time no, uh, stimulate the gallbladder to contract, thereby releasing into the duodenum. Okay? They are both produced, the secretin and the cholecystokin are both produced in the liver, uh, sorry, are, are both produced in the duodenum but their function is to, this one, cholecystokinin, to contract the gallbladder. But secretin is to, to uh, signal the liver to secrete more of the bile. Other um, substances that are found in the duodenum are bile salts. No? The bile salts, as indicated by the blue arrow, they stimulate the bile secretion. Now, over 90% uh, of the bile salts um, as mentioned here, are reabsorbed in the ileum or in the small intestine and they will be returned to the liver where they stimulate additional secretion of bile salts. So basically, bile salts and secretin are, uh, they both produce um, uh, 
uh, and their function is to uh, uh, stimulate the production of pile in the liver. Okay, while your colic is talking in is to contract more bile to secrete it in the duodenum. Okay, so that's the control of bile secretion and release. <clears throat> okay, let's go now to the next. Um, accessory organ of digestion, we have your pancreas. They are located posteriorly to the stomach and at the inferior part of the left upper quadrant. It's pancreatic head near midline of the body, while the tail extends to the left and it touches the spleen. Pancreas has two functions. You have endocrine part and the exocrine part. The endocrine part will be most, mostly tackled during the endocrine system, but the endocrine part here, they have this pancreatic islet or islets of flanger hands that produce insulin and glucagon. Take note this, that this insulin and glucagon are hormones that control the glucose production in our body. The exocrine tissue, that is the part of the digestive system where they produce digestive enzymes. These digestive enzymes class are um, actually needed to further break down the macromolecules inside our body, that the food that we intake. Okay. Um, another medical condition that um, this involved, the pancreas is involved, is acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis, from the name itself, it's there is an inflammation of the pancreas. Usually, the patient will come in at the emergency room with an epigastric pain. No, at the middle of the um, at the epigastric area, but this time the pain uh, radiates at the back of uh, at the back. No, usually the pancreas is um, a retroperitoneal organ, meaning it is found at the back. So when you have a patient who is who complains of an epigastric pain and the pain radiates at the back, you suspect of an acute pancreatitis. Uh, what should we do? Uh, you tell the patient to uh, do not eat or drink anything. We'll have to observe them. And then you, you obtain set, um, necessary laboratory um, lab, labs like amylase and lipase. They are actually uh, specific tests for an acute pancreatitis. But basically, more specific ang lipase or the pancreatic lipase compared to a pancreatic amylase. Take note of that. Okay? Okay. So this is the pancreas. So you have the head of, of the pancreas here at the midline. You have the body of the pancreas and the tail of the pancreas that touches the spleen. Um, it, this is actually nice to know. The most common part of the pancreas or um, yeah, most common part or location of the pancreatic cancer is actually the head of the pancreas. Okay. Okay, this is just an anatomy and histology of the pancreas. Uh, the pancreatic islet here, uh, sorry, the pancreatic um, asinus or assigner cells are the digestive part, while at the center is your islets of flanger heads. This is the um, endocrine portion of the pancreas. The cells here producing more, no? uh, the, the, the glucagon and insulin are actually hormones of the islets of Langerhans or the pancreas. Um, at this point, all you need to remember is that the glucagon, the hormone glucagon, increases uh, sugar in our blood or glucose in our blood, while insulin, after intake of food, it, it uh, decreases our blood sugar, and that is the function of your insulin that is found in the islets of Langerhans. Um, whenever that pancreas or islets of Langerhans detect that there is an excess or an increase, uh, an increase in blood sugar or blood glucose in our body, insulin will automatically be secreted into the circulation. Okay. Okay, what are the control of their pancreatic secretion? Number one, yeah, this is the pancreas. Number one would be parasympathetic stimulation. So from the vagus nerve, this will cause the pancreas to release a secretion that is rich in digestive enzymes. No? 
that will be in a form of pancreatic juices. Next, secretin. Okay, secretin that is released here from the duodenum will stimulate, will, sorry, would go to the blood circulation to stimulate the pancreas to release a watery secretion that is rich in bicarbonate ions. Okay, this is after a high fatty diet or high fatty meal. Another, your cholecystokinin is released from the duodenum and it will also cause the pancreas, it will go to the circulation, it will go to the pancreas to release a secretion that is rich in digestive enzymes. Again, cholecystokinin, it will, um, uh, it will increase the release of the pancreas of digestive enzymes while the secretin rich in bicarbonate ions. Okay. So again, you've encountered these two hormones, the secretin and cholecystokinin. So they control the release of secretion from the pancreas as well as the release of bile from the liver as well as contraction of the gallbladder to release bile. Okay. So please take note of these two common hormones of digestion. Okay. So we've talked about the anatomy of the digestive tract. The, we've talked about the accessory organs of the digestion. So what are is what are what is really a digestive process or a digestion? Digestion is a breakdown of food that occurs in the stomach and the mouth. Okay. The propulsion is a process that moves food through the digestive tract, and that includes swallowing and peristalsis, as discussed in an early part of the lecture. Absorption primarily happens in the duodenum and jejunum of the small intestine. Thus, the small intestine is the major absorptive organ. The defecation is defined as the elimination of waste products of digestion in the form of a feces. Okay, so please take note of the four digestive process. In digestion, no, as you can see in this illustration, or in your figure 16.22, once we take the food, okay, we, we there is food intake. Primarily, it is consists of carbohydrates, lipids, and or proteins. The carbohydrates are broken down into monosaccharides, where the lipids will be broken down into two, into fatty acids and monoglycerides. So another macromolecule, your proteins, that what, what we uh, protein in, once there is a protein intake, it will be uh, broken down into simpler forms of protein or simple blocks of protein called your amino acids. Okay. Okay. In this illustration, this is the digestion of each carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. First, we have the carbohydrates. Once in the mouth, it will be acted upon by the salivary amylase. And then that carbohydrates will be broken down into polysaccharides and disaccharides at first. It will go to the stomach. Now, once it goes to the duodenum, once this polysaccharides and disaccharide that is acted upon by the pancreatic amylase, it will become disaccharide. So again, the carbohydrates, once it is acted upon by the salivary amylase, it will just produce polysaccharides, and disaccharides. But once this is acted upon by the pancreatic amylase, it will now produce disaccharides. Okay? At the epithelium of the small intestine, there is what we call your disaccharidases. These are enzymes that breaks down disaccharide. From this disaccharide, once it is acted upon by this disaccharidesis that is found in the small intestine, it will be broken down into the monosaccharides, which is a uh, glucose. That's an example of a monosaccharide. Now let's go to the lipids. It goes to the mouth. It goes to our stomach. But once in the duodenum, okay, once it goes to the duodenum, it they will be acted upon by the bile salts that is found in the from the liver and lipase that is found in the pancreas. Okay. Once there is breaking down of lipids, it will go here at the epithelium of the small intestine for reabsorption, but it is in the form of fatty acids and monoglycerides. 
Okay? This is uh, when the lipids are broken down. Q2, it is broken down into fatty acids and monoglycerides by the help of these bile salts in the liver, from the liver and lipase from the pancreas. And last, macromolecule is your proteins. It goes to the mouth, but at the stomach, it will act upon by this pepsin that is um, released from the chief cell of the proteins. It will be broken down into polypeptides first. Once this polypeptide enters into the duodenum, they will act upon by the pancreatic enzymes. And we call that pancreatic enzymes as their trypsin, chemotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. Okay, so these are enzymes or the digestive enzymes that are released from the pancreas. Okay, take note of this. At the stomach, there are polypeptides. Once they enter they, once they enter in the duodenum, they will be acted upon by these digestive enzymes from the pancreas, and they will become peptides. Okay, just like your carbohydrates at the epithelium of the small intestine you may find peptidases. These are enzymes that are responsible for breaking down peptides. At the epithelium of the intestine, of the small intestine, the proteins will be broken down from the polypeptides to the peptides down to the simpler or building blocks of protein, and we call this your amino acid. So in this illustration alone, as you can see, you know where this specific a macromolecule is breaking down, break, broken down into a simpler form. What are these enzymes that are acted upon by this? And usually at the small intestine where, the, where all your digestive or reabsorption happens, they are broken down into simpler forms of these macromolecules. Okay, so the enzymes that are involved in the digestion of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins are in relation to what region of the digestive tract where each functions. Okay, so please take note of that illustration or figure. Okay, as a review, the carbohydrate in carbohydrate digestion, your polysaccharides split into disaccharides by the salivary and your pancreatic amylases. But basically, to be specific, the disaccharides uh, will become monosaccharide by this pancreatic amylase. Okay? As seen here by this um, area. So again, sorry, the polysaccharides or the disaccharides as acted upon by the pancreatic amylase will become first disaccharides. And in the epithelium na lang, when these are acted upon by disaccharides, it will be broken down into monosaccharides. Disaccharides broken down into monosaccharides by this enzyme at the surface. The glucose is a, a, is a monosaccharide, is absorbed by co-transport with the sodium into intestinal epithelium. That glucose is carried by the hepatic portal vein to the liver and it enters most cells by facilitated diffusion. As you all know, glucose is actually a form of energy or ATP. <clears throat> this is uh, an illustration or transport of glucose across the intestinal epithelium. So basically, this is the intestinal epithelium and this is the glucose. The glucose is absorbed by symport with sodium into intestinal epithelial cells. So gl glucose and sodium will be reabsorbed. The symport Okay, is driven by a sodium gradient that is established by the sodium potassium uh, pump or sodium potassium ATPase pump. Once the glucose is inside the epithelial cell, it will move out of the intestinal epithelial cell by the so called facilitated diffusion. Okay, the glucose enters the capillaries of the intestinal villi and is carried to the hepatic portal vein to the liver. Right? Now, next, we have the lipid digestion. Uh, bio salts emulsify lipids. So after a high, a high fatty food intake, the bile salt will emulsify the lipids at the duodenum. The lipase that is uh, produced by the pancreas will, be, will break down lipid, which form your micelles. Micelles are in contact with the intestinal epithelial cells 
and diffuse with the cells where they are packaged and released into lacteals. Lipids then are stored in adipose tissue and in liver. So if you have a high food intake or you are fond of uh, drinking alcohol, so more uh, adipose tissue, more lipids will be stored in the adipose tissue and the liver, uh, making you, uh, uh, well, producing a fatty liver. Or sometimes there is storage of your fat in the adipose tissues. Okay, just like your glucose, this is your transport of lipid across the intestinal epithelium. So this is again your intestinal epithelial cells, and this is your micelles. Your micelles or our bile salt surround the uh, fatty acids and monoglycerides, and that is your micelles forming micelles. Micelles will attach to the cell membranes of the intestinal epithelial cells. And this one, uh, the fatty acids and monoglycerides will pass by simple diffusion. Okay, They will pass by simple diffusion into the small intestinal epithelial cells. Within these intestinal epithelial cells, the, the fatty acids and the monoglycerides no, are then reconverted back to triglycerides. The proteins will coat the triglycerides to form what we call your chylomicron. Okay? This chylomicron is ready to move out of the intestinal system by exocytosis. So the chylomicrons here this time at the lacteals, they will enter into the lacteals of the intestinal villi and they will be carried to the lymphatic system to the general circulation. And this is one difference of a glucose transport, right? So glucose transport, they will go to the capillary going or moving out to the liver, while the, the chylomicron will go to the lacteals, and lacteals is, uh, are found at the intestinal villi. They will be carried through the lymphatic system to the general circulation, okay? And lastly, your protein digestion. Proteins are split into polypeptides by enzymes that are secreted by the stomach and pancreas. No? Peptides and amino acids are absorbed into the intestinal epithelial cells, thus producing amino acids. They are actively transported into the cells through the help from the growth hormone and insulin, and the amino acids are used to build new proteins. Okay, Just like the glucose and fatty uh, acid or lipids, this is the transport of amino acid. Number one, once there is um, acidic and mostly neutral amino acids are absorbed, there is same part that is driven by the sodium potassium pump. The amino acids this time are will be moved out of the intestinal epithelial cells and the amino acids, just like glucose, enters the capillaries of the intestinal villi are carried to the hepatic portal vein to the liver. So basically, they have the same transport with the glucose. Okay, What about water and minerals? So we've talked about the movement or digestion and transport of macromolecules, namely your uh, glucose, uh, sorry, your carbohydrates, your lipids, and your proteins. So of course, there is water and minerals. Water can move across intestinal wall in either direction. So it depends on osmosis where, <clears throat> or on osmotic con conditions. 99% of water entering to the small and large intestines are actually absorbed. So minerals are actively transported across the wall of the small intestine. So basically water, uh, the, more the, the more water that we intake, the more that is secreted uh, through our urine, the more that is absorbed in the circulation and the more it is uh, found in our urine. But the minerals, they are actively transported across the wall of the small intestine. Okay? All right. So this is just a summary or of a fluid volume in the digestive shop when we talk about water and minerals. So if, if, if there is a two liter of water that we ingest, from the salivary gland secretion, which is made up also of water, comprised of one liter. Okay.
Okay. Gas check secretions can also lead. Uh, it's basically, or there are majority, there are of water. So it is composed of two letters. Based from the bile secretion and pancreatic secretion, the totaling amount of two liters secretion. Okay. Aside from the pancreas, your bile, we also have again a two liter of small intestinal secretion. But take note by this red arrow, as um, the name imply, the small intestine took 90% of the reabsorbed uh, um, uh, structures. So 92% being the small intestine, the major absorptive organ. Uh, basically, 6 to 7%. No, I mentioned kanina 10%. 67% only will be, will be reabsorbed in the large intestine. And therefore, uh, leaving to 1% of water in the feces. Now, water in the feces is actually ingested, secreted, minus the reabsorbed um, molecules. So before we end this lecture, water is really important in the digestive system. Not just uh, water that is being excreted and ingested, but also water can be reabsorbed. And it is actually a um, major composition of this secretion, the salivary, the gastric, the pancreatic, and the small intestinal secretion. Mostly, it's made up of water. Okay? So that would be the fluid volumes from all, all, from all the digestive tract from the mouth down to the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, until it is excreted in the feces. Okay, so that ends our lecture in the anatomy and physiology of the digestive system. If you have questions, clarifications, or queries about the anatomy and physiology of the digestive system, please message me through your telegram. Thank you for listening, and have a good day.